Thank you very much, Brenda, for the introduction. And I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to say a warm welcome to our audience. And uh, I really appreciate your time for being with us today. And uh, we have a broad spectrum of audience from industry, from academia, students. And I hope by the end of this presentation, we can get a new perspective on feed formulation. So today I'm going to talk about novel techniques in poultry feed formulations. So let's get it started. As an outline, we are going to talk about feed formulation steps. And I'll talk about different targets in feed formulation, least cost feed formulation, maximum profit, uh, stochastic feed formulation, which accounts for variability in nutrient composition of feed ingredients, multiple objective uh, programming, which accounts for variability in market and ingredients composition. And also, I'll walk you through some feed formulation practice in Excel. And uh, I'll talk about uh, future direction, where we really want to go with this, and what improvements we can have for uh, feed formulation optimization in the future. So if you have ever caught toy in the door, you know uh, feed formulation main steps are defining nutrient requirements of the animal. And then you need to really understand nutrient composition of feed ingredients. Not only nutrient composition of feed ingredients, but also, you know, looking at uh, anti-nutrients, anti-nutritional factors, and how you are going to manage this what additives you need to add in this case, and you need to really understand your feed. And at the end of the day, you are going to use a precise feed formulation method to match nutrient supply with nutrient requirements. So it is our ultimate goal in feed formulation. Here you can see a couple of software that are available, for example, WUFFDA, which uh, formulates diets based on least cost feed formulation and uh, is a open source actually uh, software. It's free. You can see CFC5. We have other software like Alex3, uh, Brill. You know, uh, some of them are open source, but some are uh, pricey and you need to pay. For example, we have some software the uh, their, uh, annual subscription is several grants, you know, uh, three grants, five grants per year. And when it comes to software cost, I think it really comes down to its capability to uh, accommodate different targets in feed formulation. But at the end of the, the you know, this meeting, I hope we can get some ideas how those uh, pricey software are working, and we can really accommodate them in a simple Excel spreadsheet. So by that, let's start with nutrient requirements, which is first step in feed formulation. So when you look at uh, manual guides to extract the uh, you know, nutrient requirements, some of them are based on age, which we would call them age-specific nutrient requirements. For example, if you are working with Lowman Brown, you will see uh, this table in manual guide, which they have categorized, you know, different phases based on the age. For example, from one to three weeks, it's a starter and so on. So, for example, if you look at the prelay diet, it tells you you need to start prelay diet at 17 weeks of age. But do you think is it a good way to define nutrient requirements based on age? I doubt it because there is variation. There is individual variation in your flock and you will have you know, different body weights and different 
flashing and body condition. So we really need to evaluate our uh, flock from the performance perspective, from the flashing and body condition perspective, and then we can define nutrient requirements. But looking at some other uh, manual guides, for example, Highline Brown, this is for uh, 2020, we can see they have uh, defined nutrient requirements based on performance. So it is performance specific, which is great. So as you can see here, they have categorized different um, phase, uh, phases based on the body weight. For example, comparing with the previous one, here it says, if you want to start your prelay diet, your birds need to have at least 14, 40 grams body weight, and then you can start your prelay diet. So it is based on growth curve, based on body weight. And I would recommend using this, but if you are working with a strain like uh, the previous one, Highline, uh, uh, sorry, Lowman, uh, which they have defined based on age, you need to convert them to uh, performance specific and then use that. So here we can see the importance of designing body weight curve and having a robust uh, growth curve, because at the end of the day, we are using this growth curve to define our uh, feeding phases and our nutritional requirements. So that's why in one of our recent publications, actually we developed some robust uh, growth models and our goal, our ultimate goal is to really have accurate and precise nutrient requirements. So briefly, I'm not going to talk about mathematical things because I want to make it as practical as possible. So, but as a, you know, overview, here we are predicting body weight based on mature body weight, WM is mature body weight, B here is the rate of maturing, and T is time. So is uh, the first T is the age of the bird uh, at which you are predicting the body weight. And T inf is the time of inflection point at, uh, on growth curve. Uh, where the growth rate is maximum for that growth phase. So what we did, actually we improved uh, this model and by, uh, by adding random variables. As you can see, we have uh, added random variables for uh, mature body weight, for rate of maturing. And our ultimate goal is to predict the age-specific body weight to better match nutrient supply to nutrient requirements and evaluate the economic impact of management decisions. And also uh, we can use these in uh, breeding programs and nutritional management decisions. <clears throat> Excuse me. My point is that when you are seeing some papers with heavy title like this, nonlinear compared growth model, uh, you need to think about how we can use it in practical. So the ultimate goal is to define phase feeding, is to define nutrient requirements. So our job is difficult. We need to actually use these data in practical uh, situations in real life. So this graph that you can see here is the fundamental of my talk today, which I'm going to talk about maximum profit feed formulation. This graph shows how nutrient requirements are determined. One of the ways to determine nutrient requirements is to use nutritional response models. What happens is you need to feed different levels of nutrients, for example, let's say amino acids or even uh, different levels of energy and plot the response or you know, uh, production criteria, uh, and you need to find the maximum response. So the nutrient requirements that have been published in so many uh, catalogs and manual guides, they are based on maximum response. 
but we we are we don't want to have maximum response because maximum response is not necessarily equal to optimum response that's why if you look at this range we have optimum response in this range but we don't know which point is optimum response when i'm talking about optimum response i mean a, nutri a level of nutrient requirements uh, that will give us maximum profit and it varies so we need to use appropriate uh, relevant mathematical models to define this optimum response but that point will uh, will be different for different uh, market situation so uh, at the end of the day the cost of energy and protein in your diet plus the price of product will dictate which point is the optimum response. So keeping this in mind, we will talk about maximum profit with formulation later on. So actually, as you saw, nutrient requirements vary. For example, for metabolizable energy requirement for laying hands, we have a range like this from 2,684 kilocalorie per kilogram all the way to 2,992. And for the broilers, again, there is a range. We have the same story for amino acids as well. But uh, which one are you going to choose? For example, from this point all the way to this point, which one are you going to choose? I'm going just to uh, yeah, show as a, a pointer. OK. so. Mathematical models will help us to define the most economical point uh, of energy. And as you know, uh, defining the energy level is the first step in balancing the nutrients requirements. That's why we really need to pay attention to the energy level. And then we will balance our nutrients based on the ratio, standard ratio between energy and nutrients. So, but maybe you just wonder, okay, why would it be different? Why there is a range for uh, nutrient requirements? So one of the possible answers is that nutrient requirements depend on the response criteria being evaluated. In some studies, they are evaluating based on improving the immune system, in others, they are looking at feed efficiency to see which nutrient uh, level would uh, actually uh, improve feed efficiency. Or in others, they are looking at the performance. So that's why we end up with different nutrient requirements. But as I said, our job is to use mathematical models to select the most economical choice under the light of ingredients cost and product price. So I, I'd like to interrupt the process of my presentation uh, and emphasize on take home messages uh, to see what uh, messages we can get from these presentations so far. So first, try to use performance specific nutrient requirements as opposed to the age specific ones. If you can't, just feel free to convert age specific to performance specific. At the second step, we need to use robust mathematical models to determine the nutrient requirements. And always let the energy and protein cost and product price dictate the dietary energy and nutrient levels because at the end of the day, we want to have profit, right? Cost, minimizing cost is not uh, everything. We need to have profit, and I'll talk about that later on. And as I said, nutrient requirements vary, and you need to choose the most uh, relevant value regarding your target. So as we talked about targets, let's define our feed formulation target at the first step. So I have gathered uh, different feed formulation targets uh, chronologically here. You can see in 1920, 
the target was to increase uh, growth rate. Then it was uh, uh, focusing on heat efficiency and the meat yield. In 1990, it was you know, to formulate least cost diet. And in 2004, uh, Dr. Guevara from Peru, uh, he developed maximum profit feed formulation. He is one of the pioneers in this study. And in 2010, <clears throat> uh, they focused uh, on sustainable uh, production. It means that profit is not enough. We need to uh, pay attention to environment. If my diet is going to excrete extra nutrients, extra nitrogen, phosphorus to the environment or not, if my diet will have footprint on the environment, we need to pay attention to this stuff. And also social concerns, especially about broiler breeders. Uh, you know, nowadays we can see there is severe feed restriction on broiler breeders, and we really need to. Uh, uh, manage that. In 2020, uh, there was a focus on uh, flock or individual animal level, which requires using precision feeding system. Again, in 2020, uh, especially in Europe, some people uh, focused on slower growth and meat quality because they believe, okay, if animal has slower growth, it's good for their animal welfare. So let's start with feed formulation models and methods. The first thing is dealing with market variation, changing in prices. As I said, first step is uh, to look at least cost feed formulation, which uh, require linear programming models. Second one is maximum profit feed formulation that we'll, we will formulate diet based on this today. Uh, and it will work based on nonlinear programming models. If you want to deal with variation in uh, feed ingredients composition, you need to use margin of safety and stochastic feed formulation. Again, I will show you how to use this. And if you want to deal with both stuff, you need to use multiple objective programming. So let's start off with least cost fit formulation. Least cost fit formulation actually is the setting of nutrient restriction intended to minimize the diet cost while meeting nutrient requirement. And the ultimate goal is to maximize the response. But as we talked about this uh, earlier, we would like to have optimum response rather than a uh, maximum response. So I'm going to show you how you can use Excel to actually create a least cost feed formulation platform, but I have explained it in details in this link. It's on YouTube and please feel free to watch it. All right. So I'm going to show my least cost feed formulation um, spreadsheet, and I hope you can see it. Okay, here, uh, actually what we are doing is we have uh, different feed ingredients. It is a pilot study. I will uh, complete it. I will put a feed library in this uh, software and make it a real feed formulation software. And we have inclusion rate. We will get our final uh, formula over here. And our ultimate goal is to actually uh, minimize the cost. So what we are doing from the data tab, we are using solver function. And what we are doing here, as you can see, our objective cell is diet cost, which is here. And I want to minimize it. So that's why uh, we can call it this cost fit formulation. By changing which cells, by changing inclusion rate of feed ingredients. And as you can see, we have 
uh, implemented some constraints about feed ingredients level, about you know nutrient levels. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to have a specific energy level, protein level, calcium, amino acid, anything. And we are using a simplex LP or linear programming here. And when you press solve, okay, solver found the solution and uh, we can use this formula, but it is not the end of uh, feed formulation. If we select sensitivity analysis from here, and press OK, then it will create a sensitivity analysis spreadsheet for us. It is really important. We need to really go through uh, each details here. And I'm going to show that um, over here for you. OK, so let's activate my pointer again, uh, pointer laser, okay. So this is the sensitivity analysis of a formulated diet. What we need to pay attention here, at the first step, it is uh, reduce cost, and also uh, paying attention to allowable increase and decrease. For example, here, if you want to interpret these values, it shows that if corn price increases by uh, this much dollar per kilogram or decreases by this much dollar per kilogram, the inclusion level, which is 57%, will remain same. But if the corn price goes beyond those values, your inclusion rate will change as well. The other thing you need to pay attention, it is reduced cost. You can see here, reduced cost for corn is zero. Why? Because we use the corn in the diet. But for example, for other uh, ingredients, like for wheat, we can see there is a value here. So this value shows if that ingredient price would change by that amount, then the software will use that ingredient in the diet. The next thing is shadow price for uh, nutrients. It is really important. And the interpretation is, for example, here we can see shadow price for protein is this much. It is uh, in the table dollar per kilogram, but over here I have converted it to dollar per ton. It means that for each unit increase in dietary protein level, the dietary cost will increase by $3.3 dollar per ton. And uh, vice versa, if you want to decrease dietary protein level uh, by one unit, the dietary cost will decrease by $3.3 dollar per ton. So the idea is, here we have a range. In which range it works? In a range of 18.5% to 20.91% of protein. How did I calculate this? Just by paying attention to allowable increase and decrease. So when we are using sensitivity output, for the we need to make sure we use them for the range given in the allowable increase and decrease. So here, actually, the protein level in my diet was 20%. So I can go uh, all the way up to 20.9%, or I can decrease it by 1.5 unit and come to 18.5%. It means that you can go uh, up as much as the value in allowable increase and down as much as uh, the value in allowable decrease. And anything outside of this range would require you to resolve and rerun the solver again. So I think it is 
uh, explanation we need to provide to our producers because we need to uh, you know care about them we need to explain our diet in every aspect just formulating a diet and saying you know good to go if you have question let me know no they don't have any question because you have not explained the diet in details you need to explain everything you need to explain okay what would happen if you know, the protein level goes up by 1% or comes down. What would happen for energy? What would happen if you change this ingredient and put other ingredients? Why this ingredient was not used in my diet? So our job as animal nutritionists is to really pay attention to our producers' needs. And I love this statement, which says, uh, People do not care how much you know, unless they know how much you care. So it is caring in our job, and we really need to pay attention to this stuff in our job. So let's move on and talk about disadvantages of least cost fit formulation. It's a great and common method to formulate diets, but still it has some disadvantages. The most important one is reducing feed cost is not everything that we want because cost side of the equation looks attractive here, but not necessarily optimizes profitability because profit formula or margin formula is revenue minus cost. And when you are minimizing cost, you are doing one part of the job, which is minimizing the cost, but you have not increased the profit. You have not maximized the profit. So that's why we need to uh, move from static feed formulation to dynamic feed formulation. Because the response of birds to dietary energy diminishes with increasing nutrient density, that's why it follows the law of diminishing return. It's, it means that as nutrient intake increases, the performance, let's say body weight or egg mass also increases, but in decreasing level. And we saw this in that fundamental graph that I showed you. So now let's dive into maximum profit feed formulation. So uh, Dr. Guevara, as I said in 2004, developed a formula and, you know, we have margin revenue minus cost. Mar revenue is product price multiplied by product amount. For example, broiler price, chicken price multiplied by uh, body weight. Uh, and minus feed cost uh, multiplies by feed intake. It is our cost. And as you know, Nutrition is around 75% of the total cost in every uh, poultry enterprise. And that's why we really need to pay attention to the nutrition. So what he did, uh, actually he fed different levels of energy and he plotted body weight and feed consumption. And he got the regression equation and he put a regression equation for body weight in this formula and also uh, for the feed consumption again they put uh, the formula uh, here and if you look at this formula the only thing uh, which is unknown it is e e is the dietary energy level so actually what the software is really doing is to find an optimum level of E to maximize the left hand side of the equation, which is margin or profit. And if you look at the mathematical perspective, it takes derivatives and from the equations and put it equal zero to find an optimum level for energy to maximize the profit. So we did the same study with layers in 2011, and the story is same. 
but instead of you know uh, body weight we plotted egg mass against different levels of energy and again we developed uh, an equation which you can use it in uh, layers uh, feeding feed formulation to maximize their uh, profit so looking at the results we saw uh, that when we were working on nlp method nonlinear programming method which is maximum profit feed formulation our margin was higher compared to linear programming model and really to test the capability of our software to uh, handle the uh, changes in prices, we increased or decreased our ingredient prices and also egg price by 25% to see what happens in terms of energy level, egg mass, prediction of egg mass, you know, feed consumption, and also margin. And what we found was if you look here, we have normal situation, which means every ingredient price and product price, we assume they are normal, but then we increase them. For example, increased corn price, decreased corn price, increased soybean meal price, decrease it and increased egg price to see what would happen to our formula. And the take home message from this slide is profit was always higher for NLP method than the LP one. NLP is maximum profit fit formulation, but LP is the least cost fit formulation. And we found that really we need to use maximum profit fit formulation. So if you uh, search this stuff online, you will end up with uh, a work book or a spreadsheet from University of Georgia and Dr. Uh, Pesty and Dr. Vendenov, they actually developed a um, spreadsheet to uh, fit the, uh, you know, experimental data to different mathematical models and then evaluate them. Because what we did, we used quadratic polynomial uh, equation, but we want to find the best equation, right? So what they did, actually they developed a spreadsheet. You are going to uh, fit your data from your flock or from experimental data to uh, different mathematical models and find the best model which is, uh, for example, based on some of residuals, R square, anything. So these are model fitting performance criteria. And at the end of the day, you will see, okay, here the highlighted uh, model, which is broken line uh, linear ascending model. It, is, it was the best scenario for an experiment. So, but my critique, my question is, what about predictive performance of the models? We are not just playing with uh, math. We are not doing mathematical models uh, per se. We want to use them in the real life. If you want to use them in the real life, you need to know if it works or not. That's why you need to really look at the predictive performance rather than model fitting performance. And to prove this, I'm going to show you uh, our results from our, one of our most recent uh, studies in broiler breeders. Actually, what we did, we uh, developed some energy requirements models in this paper, and I called it architecture of broiler breeder energy partitioning models because we really uh, dived into the uh, mathematical models, and I will show you what happened. So some potential implications of these kinds of papers would be to find valid estimated coefficients for maintenance, growth, and egg production. Look, we are moving from empirical models to mechanistic models. 
what I have shown you so far, they were uh, empirical models, but we need to move to one level higher, to mechanistic level. And I will explain that, how would it possible? So actually we increased predictive performance of energy intake models to match nutrient supply with nutrient requirements. Again, whenever I'm showing a matching nutrient supply with nutrient requirements, it is the ultimate goal in feed formulation. So what we did, we had four different models, energy partitioning or let's say energy prediction model. The first one you can see here was a fixed effect model. The second one, actually we accounted for the variation associated with individual maintenance. And in the third one, we accounted uh, for the variation related to age. And on the fourth one, actually we accounted uh, to variation related to individual average daily gain. If you remember at the start of my uh, talk, I talked about individual variation in the flock and producers know that, yes, there is variation. But with these models, we are taking account for those individual variation. And to uh, just evaluate our models, at the first glance, we can see, okay, the best fitting performance model was this model, model three. I'm not going to details. I'm just going to prove my critique to the uh, workbook developed by uh, the authors that I mentioned. So, but if we look at the autocorrelation bias, we can see this model has the most autocorrelation bias. Now just imagine if I were to use uh, that spreadsheet to find the best model, the best mathematical model to, you know, to fit my data into, what would happen? I would use a model with which had a worse autocorrelation bias. That's why we need to evaluate the models thoroughly. We, we don't just pay attention to the model fitting performance. So then we looked at the lowest autocorrelation bias and model, and it was model three in daily uh, scale. But again, it had lo uh, lowest autocorrelation bias, but it uh, didn't have a reliable fitting and uh, predictive performance. That's why we moved to the second best model from the autocorrelation bias standpoint, and we defined our model of choice because we saw, okay, this model had a pretty good uh, fitting and performance uh, criteria. So, and as I said, this model was uh, in uh, random term associated with individual maintenance. So look at this graph. It shows the power of a robust model. So this model that you can see here is the energy model. We are predicting energy requirement of birds, which is a function of body weight, positive average daily gain, negative average daily gain, and egg mass. So if we uh, import these uh, uh, criteria, we would end up with metabolizable energy intake per day. But what we did, actually we evaluated uh, ROS708 recommended uh, target body weight by looking at its recommended ME intake. It means that in this model, we estimated average daily gain. We uh, put uh, performance objective data from ROS708 manual guide into this model, and we estimated average daily gain, and then we uh, plotted the new graph, the growth curve. And we saw if we go with recommended uh, metabolizable energy intake data, our birds will be heavier 
compared to uh, their recommended target body weight. The other day, we had a meeting with uh, AVHM people, and they confirmed that, that they said, yes, in our customers, whenever they followed our metabolizable energy intake data, their birds, in fact, were heavier compared to our recommended target body weight. I want just to emphasize here the power of a good, robust mechanistic model that can predict this stuff, which can be seen in a real life. So take home messages so far. Uh, the first message is maximum response. For example, body weight is not always equal to maximum profit. And minimizing cost is just part of the story. And as I said, we really need to pay attention to the profit, not only to uh, cost. So, and really we need to try to evaluate mathematical programming models thoroughly, not just from the fitting performance perspective. Here, I want, uh, you know, people from academia that they are attending this webinar, please, when you are reviewing an article, pay attention to these things. And if you see a paper that they just reported the fitting performance and that's it, please give a suggestion and recommendation. No, you need to improve your paper. You need to show predictive performance of the models. Why? Because at the end of the day, we really need to use these uh, models in the real life. We need to develop the manual guides based on these models. If we have you know, unreliable models published in uh, journals, then uh, we will see disadvantage of that in the real life, in our industry. So that's why I really want you to uh, be a little bit strict with this stuff. Okay. If you are interested in creating a maximum profit feed formulation, this is the link for you, and you can go with that. But I'm just going to have a short look so i'm going to just okay so maximum profit feed formulation spreadsheet here you can see the story is a little bit different because in addition to uh, cost we have profit here as well if you look at the formula this one is the uh, formula of profit that I showed you earlier. So, uh, you know, the broiler price times by uh, performance minus feed cost times by feed consumption. Here you need to import broiler price as well. If you are working with layers, you need to import your egg price here. And then at the end of the day, when you are going to, uh, use solver to balance the diet. Here you can see our target cell is profit, not the cost. And we want to maximize it. And again, we have some constraints and we are using nonlinear models here, not linear models. And I'm going to solve it. So again, solver found the solution. If there is any problem, you end up with infeasible uh, formula, you need to try again. You need to find where the problem is. Again, I'm going to activate sensitivity analysis and just show a simple thing here. So here, actually, we have a Lagrange multiplier, which is a new term because in previous one, we had a shadow price. But because we are working with nonlinear programming models here, instead of shadow price, we have Lagrange multiplier, but the idea is same. And also, instead of reduced cost, we have reduced gradient, which is a little bit, I said, different just in, uh, from uh, names, but the concept is same. So, 
I'm going to, okay, close up that one and come back to my presentation again. Okay, now we are moving to variation to see what, how we can really uh, manage variation in nutrient composition of feed ingredients. You are buying different batches of soybean meal, wheat, anything. And you see there is variation. One batch has, let's say, 40% uh, protein. In another batch, it is 45. I don't know, 50. So you need to really pay attention to this. One uh, actually way is to use an IR device. And now there are some portable NIR device, devices that you can just use, ding, you know, uh, read the uh, composition. But the challenge is that you need to calibrate your device. You need to have different kinds of ingredients with different nutrient composition to calibrate your device, and then you can use it in real life. So that's why I really like this statement from uh, George Dancing, father of mathematical programming. We are living in uncertainty. He said, I work on planning under uncertainty. That's the big field as far as I'm concerned. That's the future. Maybe I'm the only one who says that. So if you look at here, at this table, as I said, here we have a mean value, minimum, maximum value for, uh, for soybean meal protein. And you can see it really varies from 44 all the way to 51%. That's why we need to use margin of safety and stochastic programming. Actually, in this programming, it's a simple way to adjust the nutrient matrix to compensate for nutrient variability. I mean, in addition to use an IR device, you can manage it through your diet formulation method as well. So the idea is to subtract one half of standard deviation of a nutrient from the mean value of nutrients. For example, here, uh, 1.41 is the standard deviation of protein level in soybean meal. And uh, what we did, I actually developed a software, an Excel spreadsheet, where we have accounted for this variation. And here you need to uh, determine the probability of meeting uh, nutrient requirements. In the least cost fit formulation, this probability is 50%. Why? Because you have variation in nutrient composition of your ingredients. But in stochastic fit formulation, you can manage this probability. You can say, okay, I'm going with 50%. It means that I want to have 50% confidence in uh, meeting nutrient requirements. Then it is least cost fit formulation, but you can increase it. You can increase it to 69%, to 80%, to whatever you want. And I'll show you in a minute. So again, if you are interested in creating a stochastic fit formulation uh, spreadsheet, I have put the link here. I have explained in details. Listen, these things, as I said, at the uh, earlier uh, of my talk, when a price of software is 5,000 bucks, there is a reason for that because they have used this stuff. But if you get yourself familiar with this stuff, you can do that. It's not so complicated, but again, it needs a little bit practice. So in Stochastic fit formulation here, you can see I have put probability of meeting nutrient requirements. I asked 80%. You can change it. You can ask 50%. If I uh, put it 50%, the next cell is zero. It means that 
it won't affect your uh, feed formulation uh, spreadsheet. It will balance your uh, diet based on least cost feed formulation. But I don't like that. I want to increase it to 80%. Again, by using data and solver, I'm going to um, uh, formulate my diet. Again, stochastic is based on nonlinear, and you can solve it. Again, please pay attention to this message. It should be a feasible diet. If you are ending up with infeasible diet, that's okay. You need to just manage it. You need to find the problem and manage it. Okay, so let's come back to our presentation. And the final one is MOP or multiple objective programming. It is the combination of maximum profit fit formulation and stochastic fit formulation. Awesome. You, you are uh, catching more goals here. And you are accounting for market and nutrient variability at the same time. Again, if you want to develop your own spreadsheet, feel free to visit uh, this tutorial video and I have explained over there in details from scratch, from a blank spreadsheet, how you can develop your models. And again, here we have multiple objective feed formulation method that, uh, uh, I mean, the idea is same, you need just to use solver and uh, solve it. Actually, my older son is 11 years old and he's a tech pro. He knows more than me about Excel, about uh, Visual Basic. The other day I was showing this stuff to him. He said, hey dad, uh, why are you not using a, a macro? Why would you not put a simple you know, button here that people don't bother to go to find solver and just think press the button and solve the diet. And I said, it's your job. You can do that for me later on. So let's come back to our presentation. So our take home messages, examine each batch of ingredients that you are receiving before formulating your diets. I don't know, you can send it to lab. You can use it, use an IR device. And remember to take account for variation in nutrient composition of feed ingredients, because what we are formulating on screen or on paper is different with what we are seeing in the real life, in the field. And we really need to pay attention to that. And always keep track of ingredients composition because it's a useful tool to enlighten the future management decision. It means that if you are buying different batches of canola meal, soybean meal, wheat, anything, then you can uh, keep track of the composition. And at the end of the day, you can get a standard deviation of locally available uh, you know, feed ingredients, and you can use it in your next uh, feed formulation. So, my last slide, future direction. Uh, I'm just going to, okay. So first we need to develop a user-friendly multi-objective feed formulation software, which I'm working on that. And uh, I'm working on developing feed library. And my target is to find, you know, nutrient composition closer to what they're being used, they are being used in North America. And then we need to investigate nutrition value of local feed ingredients. And at the end of the day, instead of using empirical models, we really need to use mechanistic models. When you are working with uh, animal performance in a model, for example, animal performance, is a function of, let's say, dietary energy. This is empirical model. But when you are going one uh, level higher with mechanistic models, 
In fact, you are not working directly with animal performance. As I showed you, for example, you are determining, defining metabolizable energy requirement based on some other criteria, based on metabolic body weight, based on uh, daily gain, based on egg mass. And then you are going to use that uh, model uh, for uh, to predict uh, animal performance. So it is mechanistic model. And I hope our new uh, software would handle this and would use mechanistic models. So by that, thank you for your attention. I really appreciate your time with being uh, to being with us today. And by that, I'm going to take any questions.